Hello, and Stenson here again. I'm hoping you can hear me well. A little bit later in the day today. I hope that's all right with you. We're here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're battening down for a big winter storm. Big in North Carolina terms. We might get, uh, who knows, nine inches today. That'd be, that'd be kind of exciting. And let me do, I am going to do uh, a couple days ago, some of you were watching, I did a watercolor drawing of this house, right? And I did what I called a formal watercolor drawing. No, uh, no illegal techniques. <laughs> All traditional approaches. Now, this one, I'm going to do a different house, but same idea. But I'm going to cheat left, right, and center. I'm going to do what I call a watercolor sketch. And it's a, this is a house uh, in New Bern, North Carolina. It's just a big, glorious lumber baron house from the turn of the cent last century. And obviously it's along the same vein. Now, this is a photograph that I took, and this is a photograph that I found on the internet. And decided I like mine better, except that I do like that this photograph shows me the, the trees that are around it. So I may incorporate some of that tree stuff going on here. So I'm going to put this picture up here where I can see it. I don't think you can see it, can you? Nope. And, uh, in fact, let me take just a second to show you my, my work situation a little bit more. Um, there's some watercolors over there. There's my photograph, uh, lights. I might work on a light table, but I'm not using the light table right now. And... Um, that's the 300 pound, sorry for a click here, 300 pound um, arches, hang on, sorry, sorry, more technical difficulties, still working on it, we're getting all the bugs worked out, 300 pound ar arches, let me show you that, watercolor paper, now, now yesterday somebody said, why are you doing watercolor? No. <laughs> of course, they texted it, so I, I can't be sure that that was their exact tone of voice. <laughs> that is the danger of uh, written communication, isn't it? I can't hear your tone of voice. But it seemed a little bit, it seemed a little bit whiny. Why are you doing watercolor? We can't see lines. I hope that person isn't watching right now because they might be a little offended. But I'm sure I got to tell you the work. Um, well, let me answer that question. Why am I doing watercolor? The answer is, in the course of years to come, uh, the daily art adventures will cover every, just about every medium, art medium known to man. And you say, why? Well, number one reason, because I'm so just so darn cocky. <laughs> Because I can do them all. That's why. That's why. Why am I doing watercolor? Because I'm good at watercolor. That's why. Somebody said, why aren't you doing like, I'm doing play on your, whatever you're hanging on to. I'll be doing everything. Okay, so enough of that cocky, arrogant kind of stuff. But uh, I wanted to tell you that, uh, I know you can't see that at all. You can't even close to see that. But you can under you can, yes, you can understand the concept. I just did a real loose sketch in yellow watercolor pencil. I can hardly see it. I know you can't see it. Then why did I do it? Precisely because I can hardly see it, but I can see it. And it got, gave, got me just the most rough, the roughest, roughest of rough sketch uh, starting. I, I, I'm running out of words. You know what I'm trying to say? The most rough of rough sketches got me started. Now I progress. This is this technique. If you're a watercolor painter or a wannabe artist of some kind, I implore you to pay attention to what I'm doing here. Did you catch that? Implore you. <laughs> hey, listen, if I, if, I, if I imitate or mock other people ever so slightly, I mock the heck out of myself. So I implore you. <laughs> Okay, uh, enough of the silliness. Now I've got an orange watercolor pencil and I'm going to sketch in. I can see my yellow lines and I'm able to make corrections. 
to my first sketch. Do you see where I'm going with this? What's my next color to be classic? First, the first color I used was, the second I used was orange. This is actually logical. Class, you are genius. You, where am I going next? What color pen? Pencil, am I going to use next? That is correct. I agree. Okay. So, so the rest of us, let's explain to those people we're doing. I started with yellow, then I went around to doing around the color wheel. Very much. You got it. Most of you got it. No, you didn't. Uh, and, and also, going from light colors to dark yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. Blue will be the darkest. Did you see? Did, that's light. That's the color wheel. Light to dark, by the way. Yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. Light to dark. Why, do, why don't I go the other way around? Well, because the, the very reason I'm using the light to dark is so that I can make corrections. And I already need to make corrections. This drawing is too big. So I'm going to, right now, I'm going to ignore all the lines that I've put down. So Well, I say no. What I mean is I'm not going to use them in the drawing, but I'm going to use them as guidelines for correcting my drawing. Does that make sense? I have two photographs here that go by say, two photographs of the same building, same house. Now I know you guys can see that. You could see the earlier stuff, but yes, you can see that. I'm going to try to make this clear. Why do I start with light colors and progress to darker and darker colors? So I can do the very exact thing that I'm, you see me doing right here, which is make corrections. Without having to erase my lines. My yellow lines, yellow lines are still there. Orange lines are still there. But you know what? As soon as I put down the darker red color, it's as if the orange disappears because the red is darker. So that is the, if you will, that is the genius of this technique. Start, and what pencils, they're great fun. You might be wondering, some of you are wondering, are all these colors going to, sh are all these lines going to show up in the final drawing? And the answer is no. I almost not to show up, but most of them will be obliterated in the course of doing the watercolor. But they won't be obliterated in a bad, ugly way. They'll be they'll be subsumed <laughs> into can I use that word? Sorry, big words here. They'll be subsumed into the a uh, watercolor paint. So I just watercolor pencil. All the it'll pick up the red. In this case, the red color, and turn it into a all round color of red. Red color. Red tone. Red wash, if you will. Okay. You might be getting the idea by now that I'm. I don't know why I'm. I like architecture. I like. Um, I like straight lines. I, I like the combination, actually, most. I like the combination of straight lines and curved lines. Let me show you something really fascinating, by the way. Um, this house, again, built around the turn of the 20th century. And I actually was there in New Bern, North Carolina, and I tromped around. Nobody was. I knocked on the door. Nobody was home. I had a business card right ready to hand them. Say I'm an artist. Blah blah. I do this all the time. Um, but one of the things that is fascinating is that the literally the glass in these windows right here, the big panes of glass, is literally curved. That blew my mind. Really? They 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 made curved glass. That's. I mean, maybe that's ordinary, and I just don't know it. That just that was just like crazy to me. And it's sort of like I had to go up and look at it really close to say, is that glass really curved? Man, 
That's <laughs> that's when they knew how to build houses. Oh, uh, that's crazy. They know how to build houses today. Okay, so uh, just a few comments about this this approach. Part of the reason I use this approach to watercolor painting. So most of the time when I do weddings, um, this is the technique that I use. The reason being because, as you will see, it's much quicker than a traditional watercolor technique. If you want to go back and look at the drawing that I did uh, day, well, day before yesterday. Actually, yesterday I did a watercolor as well. It's, it's ironic. My, my first, what, four of my, all five of my first art adventures this year have been in watercolor. That is so funny, because as the year goes on, um, you will find that it's not my primary medium. It used to be. It was for 25 years. It was my primary medium, but it hasn't been hasn't been my primary for a long time. But here, I'm five days in a row doing watercolor. Why? Okay, I gave you one snobby answer. The answer is because I can. Buckaroos. Here, there, here's another a little bit nicer, friendlier answer is because it's fun, just because it's, why do I do watercolor? Because it's fun. And uh, I know a lot of you like to do watercolor as well. Uh, so let me show you. I, you saw me doing this, but I didn't explain it. Just in case you've missed it before, you notice that the very first thing that I did when I began this drawing is I drew a border about an inch and a half in from the edge all the way around. I may grow out of that someday, but hey, I'm 60, coming up on 63 years old, and I still do it. So the chances of me abandoning that technique are growing slimmer <laughs> as the decades pass. Let me tell you why I do it. The reason there's two reasons. Are you ready? Art lecture, art lecture number one. Let me put this so you can see it. Why do I draw a border? The most important reason is because, and I'm talking as if you, everybody watching is an artist and an art student, right? So I'm just going to keep on talking to you as if, as if you're an art student. The most important reason is because, believe it or not, psychologically, the edges of a piece of paper are invisible to you psychologically. Most people, when they look at a drawing on a piece of paper, they don't go, hmm, edge, edge. Line, line, edge. They don't do that. They just say, here's a drawing, it's on paper. They don't realize that the edge of the paper is the most significant or major design element in their artwork when they start out. Does that make sense? You ignore the edges of the paper. You don't say, hmm, edge of paper. But you should be saying that. So what I do is I trick myself. And I say, <laughs> You're so smart, Mr. Dan Nelson. <laughs> I'm going to trick you, I say to myself. I'm going to draw a border inside the edge of the paper. And as soon as I border, yes, absolutely. Whoa. Line, line, edge, boundary, line, edge, significant part of the composition. Does that make sense? Edges of paper are psychologically invisible. We don't think about it. As soon as you draw a border, you go, bam, I have a border. That's the number one reason I draw a border. The number two reason I draw a border is exactly what you see here. So I have cheating room. This house is going just a little bit lower than I would like on this page, but thank goodness I have an inch and three quarters boundary down here that I can fudge, I can cheat into. Because so my, my drawing is actually going to go all the way down to here. Whoa. Now some of you guys need to pay attention to that. Say, doggone, that's a good idea. And I never thought of it before. <laughs> I don't know why I go into stupid voice when I'm, when I'm imitating what you're supposed to be saying to me. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm just mean and nasty at heart. That is very possible. <laughs> but we both get over it, don't we? We just get over it and just ignore that I used a stupid voice. So as you can see, that is a really fast 
sketch, especially compared to the pencil drawing that I did a couple days ago. The last time I did that river, what was it called? River Forest Manor. Okay, that was like on Wednesday. If you want to go back and look at it, I spent, oh, well over an hour doing doing the sketch. And I just done all of it there in whatever, 15 minutes. Okay, yellow, orange, red. I made a big adjustment between my orange. See this line up here? I moved this line from here down here between orange and red. But I don't even have to pay any attention to that. I don't have to erase it. I just leave it there. And uh, hang on. I've got a purple pencil now in my hand. And I'm hoping my erase my uh, there we go. I'm hoping my electric pencil sharpener. You know what I wish somebody would invent? Maybe there is such a thing out there, but I wish somebody would invent a pencil sharpener that is strong, that isn't weak as all get out. How weak is all get out? Stop bothering me, would you? With all these hard questions. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, we'd like to know how weak is all get out. Because <laughs> you said you'd like a pencil sharpener. And it's not weak as all get out. <laughs> oh, okay. I have two purples here. One is kind of a raspberry purple. And one is a uh, purple, purple, purple. And uh, I think I'm going to go with purple. So what am I doing now? Now I am taking the drawings. Close enough. I'm, by the way, here's an interesting thing. I'm going out, you see how I've been holding it like this? Sometimes today, even like this? Crazy, man. Now I'm going to switch to my... drawing grip instead of my sketching grip. So this will take a few minutes. And you can see maybe not everything I'm doing, but you can get the basic idea. I'm looking at my reference a lot. Look, glancing up at the house very much. And you'll notice as soon as I do purple lines near on top of the Red lines, red lines virtually disappear. And I don't mean literally disappear. You can see them. But psychologically, we, we pay no attention to them anymore. They, they disappear from our consciousness, if you will. It's, we can ignore them. That's, again, that's why I go from dark, from light colored pencil to dark. And I'm, I better be careful here. I have a ruler over here somewhere. Here it is. Um, now it's time to make sure that I've actually got my perspective. Boy, nothing's more irritating than getting, you know, 80% through a drawing and then discover that you just really, really screwed up the perspective. People will forgive all kinds of drawing mistakes, but they really forgive um, perspective errors. Now, I, you heard me say the other day, you don't have to be exact on perspective. You just have to be close enough that people can't see that you're off. Does that make sense? You, you, you do not, not have to be exact. You just have to be close enough that people can't see uh, And, and uh, that's a, an important distinction. Close enough is good enough. Okay, and I've got some of these. I mean, I, the, you, can, you can see why I took a picture of this house. I took a picture of dozens of houses, hundreds of houses around New Bern, North Carolina. Uh, but this is probably, you know, every, every small town has one. Uh, every small town has the, actually every city does too, but in a city there's too many to notice. Every, every small town has the grandest house in town. Kind of makes you wonder about the personality of the the man who built it. By the way, it's always a man. That is uh, anyway. Um, nobody looks at a house like this and said, "Oh, wonder what woman built that house." And I'm not being sexist here. Um, sexist is saying that male or female is inferior. In this case, that female is inferior. Well, that is hardly what I believe, but male and female are quite, quite different, and uh, 
what do you have 19th century? Now, here's a good question. Yeah, but in the 21st century, will there be, in fact, enough female architects that that archetype, <laughs> ooh, that's a good clever phrase, but could there be enough archi female architects that that archetype would be reversed? Um, good question. Good question. I, my, I'm inclined to think, again, I'm, I'm not being sexist, um, I'm not defending myself. I'm, it's, it's, if you're not accustomed to philosophical discourse, you're not used to subtleties. But um, um, I sort of doubt, because I think there's something in the male psyche that drives him or us, if I may put myself in the male psyche department, there's something in the male psyche that drives us to build that isn't quite the same. That doesn't mean that women can't build. For instance, I, I think in the... It doesn't mean that women can't fly planes, but few enough women fly planes in the experimental, you know, I'm talking about here, aviation, um, cutting-edge aviation science. That There's a section of the... Uh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. There's a section of the Smithsonian dedicated to women, cutting-edge women flyers. Let me ask you, why is there not a section in the Smithsonian dedicated to male pilots, experimental and cutting-edge pilots? Why? Everybody knows the answer. Because all the experimental pilots are male, except for the few that are female. That's why they have a special section for the female ones, because they're the except they're the outliers. Uh, what, how did I get into this? I get myself on these wild tirades and then can't remember how I got here. I was talking about nobody looks at a building from this era and says, what woman built that? <laughs> that's, by the way, that's a quote somebody else. I won't, I won't go any farther than that. Nobody looks at the New York skyline and says, I wonder what woman built that thing. No. Um... So, it, yeah, it makes you wonder about the, the ego. <laughs> it makes you wonder a lot of things um, about the, the man that would build a house like this. The, you know, the grandest tiger in the jungle syndrome. Um, every town has one. I, in, in the course of looking at choosing, picking out this photograph, I, I was looking at I, uh, um, some of my photographs from... Washington, North Carolina. Some of us affectionately call it Little Washington. Others affectionately call it the original Washington because it was actually named be, be prior to before Washington, D.C. Um, and likewise, there is the, you know, the grandest house in town. Sometimes there's competition for the grandest house. Other times, like this, I don't think there's really any, even any competition this man clearly wanted to make a statement, and clearly he's he's dead now, but he's still making a statement a hundred years after the house was built. I forget exactly when it was built, but you know it was about a hundred years ago. You can tell that just by looking at it. You can tell by the era that it comes from. Now. So far, I haven't had any major mistakes in my drawing. A few little minor things that you won't notice. M nobody would ever even notice. Uh, I notice them because I'm going, oh, wait, I didn't quite put that in the right place. But happily, so far, I haven't, haven't had to uh, erase anything or uh, not erase. I mean, redraw. And by the way, I'm doing purple right now, and it looks as though uh, that's going to do. I don't need to go to blue. So earlier I said I would do... You know, yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. Well, it turns out I don't need to do blue, so I'm just going to do yellow, orange, red, and purple because I am the the purple is is turning out to be adequate drawing. I don't need to do any more than this. And let me tell you a little bit where I'm going then. After after this drawing is done, my next the next thing I'm going to do is traditional watercolor. By the way, just for fun, I'm using my old friend, my 44-year-old watercolor tray. I say that because 
if you watched me the last couple of days, I've happily introduced my brand new, replacing my 44-year-old trick. My brand new. Um, here's a little mistake, by the way. If you want to know what I mean by a mistake, this awning, this uh, gay bolt right here, is actually supposed to come out to about here. It's supposed to be that much longer, and it's shorter there. That's what I call the, the kinds of mistakes that really probably don't matter most of the time. So I'm just going to tuck it in a little bit tighter than it actually is. I could run into problems down here because of that, but I, I hope not. In most cases, like a, a mistake that small, probably, even probably, the owner of the house wouldn't even catch it. Um, and I say that to, to let you know there are certain mistakes that are you can get away with. Just doesn't matter. They're not not worth. And I think I tend to be getting close to this edge of the page, and uh, I just making myself cut short. I just smudged my paper here with a purple pencil. I want to see if just want to see if the needed eraser almost it almost gets off that smudge. Not quite. Again, for those of you who just joined me, um, I started out my drawing with a, the sketching grip, holding a pencil this way, which is the real way to hold a pencil if you want to draw and create and be get the big lines down. But I'm all the way down to details now, so it's okay to hold my pencil in the traditional. It's a much more restricted grip, the traditional is. And uh, I'm, I'm free to use it because I know that my major lines are properly placed. So that gives me the freedom then to begin to uh, use a more restricted grip. Those of you who have taken my drawing classes or maybe you've seen me online, you know that I'm a big proponent of holding a pencil side saddle. And uh, my students always complain, it feels weird. Of course it feels weird. You spent your whole life since third grade or second, first grade holding a pencil in the traditional penmanship grip. So it's going to feel weird, but just stick with it. You'll get over it soon enough. And it is a skill absolutely worth learning. That is learning how to hold a pencil for drawing or, or more technically speaking, for sketching. Then when you get down to details, as I am now, then you can, you can do a traditional drawing grip. So I sometimes, if I'm speaking carefully, I make a distinction between a drawing grip and a um, sketching grip. Boy, they're all lined up. Let me show you again, some of you who just joined me. Here's the photograph that I'm working from. And uh, I, will, I will answer questions later on. These paintings are all for sale and just this afternoon I have uh, spent some time getting my online store up and run. Uh, you, you see it on Facebook and uh, eventually I'm, I expect to have hundreds of images, hundreds, not images, hundreds of original art pieces available for sale uh, at this store. Okay, here's a, here's a mistake. Um, this roof needs to come down here. Okay, I'm just going to cheat a little bit, extend this. I like to say that in the business, in that's what we call in the business a screw up. <laughs> uh, and then I usually say, witness my distress. And I laugh out loud. In other words, it does, doesn't matter. It's uh, again, it's a small enough mistake that most people won't even, even notice what's going on, that there's an error there, that, you know, there's a gap that's too small, small one gap. So that's, you want to keep your mistakes small enough the mistakes that people will not overlook are glaring 
perspective errors. Those are the ones that you really want to try to get right. And, uh, you know, I say that, and, and I, boy, I better be looking and making sure I'm not doing that myself. I, I think I'm okay at the moment. And again, your perspective doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be perfect enough so that nobody can tell it's off. That and that it sounds like I'm mincing words or being tricky or cute or something, but I'm I'm really not. Um, I really I want you to understand where the because some people, some of you maybe are are you beat yourselves up with perfectionism, and you say it's a little bit off. Well, a little bit's okay. Um, you just have to be close enough. To fool the viewer, if I can use that that term. In a minute here, I want to start talking about what's really important about this. And in fact, what is important about... Whoops, I just did a line in the wrong place. Okay, What is important about all paintings, about all art? Believe it or not, it's not all these silly little lines. These lines are necessary. It's This is just sort of a necessary evil. <laughs> Can I, can I use that term? These lines are necessary. I have to get them down. Or, you know, I won't have a house. Um, I might have a mushroom. I might have a, a, a piece of nondescript gobbledygook abstract stuff. I say that with great affection, as you know, because I do a lot of abstracts. But I won't have a house, so I have to do the drawing in order to get the house down. Um, but the drawing is not the important, is not the salient feature, is not the important part, is not what matters. Well, then what does matter, Mr. Nelson? <laughs> so glad you asked. So glad you asked. Let me tell you what is important. Write this down. Write this on the something something of your heart get this down in deep in your being in your gut the most important aspect of drawing or painting of two-dimensional representational represent, representational art the most important aspect is anybody know some of you got it because you've taken my class you've heard my rants before that's right. The most important aspect is play of light. What nobody gives basically a fly on a rip what this house looks like. <laughs> what they do give a fly and rip about <laughs> whatever, whatever a fly and rip is. What they do <laughs> what they do give that about <laughs> is what the light is doing on the house, to the house, what is happening. And so far, I haven't even given the slightest hint or indication that may be a weakness um because i there's so many lines here that uh i i just feel compelled felt compelled to just man i, just, I got a pile of drawing to do okay now i don't know who's keeping score here i how long have i been going i'll, I'll look in a minute I, my my uh facebook live will tell me how long i've been been drawing about 40 minutes maybe something like that I just want to let you know that that is a heap of fun in 40 minutes. And the drawing is basically done. So, traditional watercolor, where is it? I left it downstairs. Traditional watercolor, I spent an hour and a half getting to Today, I spent 40 minutes. Now, here's something kind of interesting. I have these lines up here in the sky, yellow lines that you can't see, orange lines, and a few red lines. Um, what's going to happen to those? When I put water on them, they'll turn into watercolor washes, so it's not a problem. Now, play of light. Well, let me show you the photograph again. It's real easy. The light's coming from the right. So, shade on this side, sun on that side. That's easy. That's the easy part. But that's not enough. That's, that, is, that doesn't count as play of light. That's like, um, if I could turn play of light into a tune, what's happening right here is, uh, hot cross buns, hot cross buns, da 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 hot cross buns. Some of you know what I'm talking about. In fifth grade, you played that on your stupid little flutophone, uh, and it was a, a melody 
designed to bring tears to the eyes of every real musician. So th this is pouring lighting. Bad light. I mean, it's better than here. Uh, yeah, it's a little better than that. I have some other pictures of this house where it's the, there's no sun at all. Boy, that's really bad. But this is boring. So I need to invent something um, that will create interest. And let me think. Now, I'm literally thinking right now. I have not made up my mind. First of all, there, I know there's going to be trees over here. And some trees here. I feel like the trees are fairly important. By the way, these are not necessarily branches. These are just reminders remind me to, to make branches and there's a couple things I could do one is if I put shadows of the tree on this on the light side that that would be let me do this as a, just a reminder don't forget the shadows that'll help me a little bit um, I'm thinking pause pause think because by the way, here's here's some shadows down here. That helps me a little bit. Got it? But there's virtually none up here, so this I can make this more interesting. And I, basically, I'm putting a tree where there isn't one, or I'm moving the sun to a different angle. Either way, it's allowable. Uh, I do I do know that the street is you know lined by trees, so there's plenty of trees around to cast shadows. Here's what I think I'm going to do. Like this is sort of a blank slate, right? Definitely have the light coming from this side. Definitely incorporate some shadows of branches on the house. That gets me to first base. I was like, okay, that's a little bit interesting. Here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to make, sort of as we're getting here, I'm going to make the, the, the star of the show is up here. This part of the building, this part of the house. The right sun hitting that. And it's sort of hinted at that in this photograph, but I'm going to exaggerate it. So that when the viewer looks at this house, it'll be kaboom! Did you catch that? Exploding off this gable. Please run this up here. Wheels wide. And, and but as the house comes down, it's more and more, more subtle. Whoa. Almost a gray. Uh, and I'm getting back here, but because that's what I need to feel some drama before I just start painting. And if you're an art student, I just demonstrated for you. You need to feel some drama too. You can't just start now. Here's what I'm, I'm going to start making sky blue mentally in the back of my mind. I'm going to back up later if I want. It's going to, it can't be a perfect blue because I've got red and orange and yellow line up here, you know, in the sky. So that's actually that. Okay, I'm going to start painting. Let me get this out of just for a second and show you how I got my, in this case, moderate, modest size paint palette. It's a cool, warm. By the way, so this is a, this green, this yellow is used to mix with green. This yellow, same exact color, is used to mix with warm. Okay, so that yellow in my the way I work, the yellow goes both ways, warm or cool, depending which way you mix it. But I, you don't want to get this contaminated with orange, and you don't want this contaminated.